The global war on terror by any other name was sold as a necessity to defend democracy. To fight them over there so we don't have to fight them at home. Western elites are whipping their people into a frenzy of fear, transgressing constitutions and trampling over civil liberties, slowly but surely embracing the security state. It's all like chemotherapy where you dose a person with poisons in the hope of killing the cancer cells, and the patient will still be alive. Well, inshallah. So what happens in countries like the United States, Britain, and France, all with strong commitments to liberal principles and with significant Muslim minorities when the war on terror turns inwards? The threat, the threat, threaten us. ISIL. ISIL. Cancer like ISIL. It's the embodiment of evil. Like ticking time bombs. A group terrorist, terror, terror, terrorist. Extreme Islamism. Oh, listen, listen, listen. Al-Nusra. We're hiding ourselves, the enemy. Action and tend to see it through. An axis of evil. Sheer evil. This brand of evil? Evil. Monsters. Death, death. This network of death. Our war, our war, our war against terror is only beginning. My counterterrorism and homeland security. security. Do what must be done to keep our country safe. We must remain vigilant. Vig vigilant. Vig vigilant. Keep America safe. 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 We will hunt down terrorists. Hunt down those responsible. Deal with these radicals and extremists. Wherever they plot and train. That's our mission. Our mission. Our mission. Our mission. Take them on wherever they are. When it all started, Al-Qaeda was a small operation with its leaders hiding in the Afghan mountains. The war on terror was going to do far more than root them out. It was going to remove dictators and create Western-loving democracies. The United States will not ignore your oppression or excuse your oppressors. When you stand for your liberty, we will stand with you. We're leaving behind a sovereign, stable, and self-reliant Iraq. We dropped by the Washington Post to speak with Dana Priest, their leading reporter on national security. It's inevitable, but also knew that they would have so much say over things. And that's what I want to talk to you about. You don't have to make the choice between privacy and security, but certainly there is no need to make the choice between democracy and security. Well, I do think that the way the government is going that's a choice that they are forcing on people. And the reason I say that is because in the government's calculation, the only way to be safe is to, be, is to have a less transparent government. And that means to have more people in this bubble making decisions behind the closed doors that you and I cannot assess. That is, to me, lessening the power of democracy. Are American troops even going back to Iraq? They are not in a combat role. They are in an advise and assist role. There will be boots on the ground. Uh, first of all, we have boots on the ground. I mean, there is a kind of game being played here. We have some 1,300 advisors. Look, uh, 13 years ago this October, we started bombing Muslims in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. We're still bombing. Do we really want to be in a position where 13 years from now we are massively occupying Syria and Iraq. I don't think that's what we want. Does any sane person think that 13 years from now we're not going to still be bombing them? Of course we are. At a site overlooking the World Trade Center Memorial, we sat down with two leading critical thinkers, Slavoj Žižek and Hamid Dabashi, to talk about the deeper implications of the war on terror. You wrote something that struck me as dramatic. You said 9-11 had put an end to the utopia of liberal democracy as a global 
dominant idea. We can see now that liberal democracy was doomed from the very beginning. So was it September 12th and the war on terror? Of course, September the 12th, because, you know, events mean nothing in themselves. Necessarily. The interpretation, yeah, the echoes, the create. exploitation. Yeah. Do you agree that this was a break in history? First of all, we should not fetishize liberal democracy as if until 9 11 everything course. was yeah. hunky dory yeah. about yeah. liberal democracy. Histories of pogroms and Holocaust and global uh, uh, colonization, all of this, women, uh, you know, underprivileged, this is all part of the history of uh, uh, liberal democracy. That's number one. Number two, the thing that is specific about 9-11 is the spectacle of violence. Violence becomes spectacular right here. It is performed for, for television. Isn't it something like the war on terror, a great justification and alibi then to regather power, authority, create a Patriot Act, create a certain surveillance, create the impression of fear? The predominant forum today of politics is what I call the politics of fear. We no longer have positive visions. We have, you know, the fear of the immigrant. Unfortunately, even much of leftist politics works like this. It's the fear of the big capital. It's the fear of ecology and so on. This, this is, is very sad. This, but this is incredibly important. Yes, so incredibly is this clear. the new paradigm? That it's no longer the, the projects of hope, the projects of expansion, that now the new paradigm is the one about fear. It is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. When you have such a radical militarization, look at Ferguson. I mean, this is just a, a, a small town in the uh, in United States. When you look at the face of American police, that they are supposed to help people to, to you know, have a safe life, with this incredible militarization, already fear, whether it's the fear of a young black man or the fear of uh, something called ISIS, which is... Uh, in, in I mean, and the ISIS is playing on it. ISIS, in my opinion, by and large, is a, again, is a visual performance. What's the, the idea that you could instill that kind of fear in a society and make it as an organizing principle, and you hold the keys as a political elite who lost all legitimacy on other yeah, grounds, yeah. that certainly bodes terribly to democracy. It's not simply, let's return to some authentic democracy. How? What do we really decide today? All the big wars, Iraq and so on, it's clear that they were decided before secretly. Fear is more or less justified at a certain level. Secrecy is more Secrecy and more in economic important. agreements. Yeah, and, and this secrecy, that's the and tragedy, policing measures. works perfectly. People tell me, why focus on the United States? They are much less free in China. Yes, but in China, at least, they don't give the illusion that they are free. The horror of the United States is that you can experience yourself as free and you are still totally controlled. That you don't even experience your own freedom. This is the key moment that the West no longer has intellectual, moral, imaginative, philosophical hegemony. So the war on terror is no longer just used by the West and the, by the Bush. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the ultimate use of the war on terror is happening happen by the likes of Putin. And Chinese and so on, practically everyone. Is this the new organizing paradigm? Is this a new framework? I think of yes, organizing because, violence. Yes, yeah, because you know what this enables you to do? On behalf of universalism, of human rights global system, you totally dehumanize the other. If we are in a nation state, situation we are enemies but still i have to respect you at least formally as an enemy state but when your enemy is a so-called terrorist it's not even another legal institution it's just a nobody out of humanity in a certain so way you take a, when you do a balance sheet of that you notice that in terms of the nation state in terms of the pre 9 11 all the all the eggs are broken now Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan. But Libya, which also fell apart as so, a state. So all the eggs are broken. Where is the omelet? <laughs> there is no omelet. No, no, absolutely. Where is the democracy? Everything was done in the name of democracy. No, no. The big elephant in the, in the room is the wave of revolutionary uprisings in the Arab world, in Europe, from uh, Greece all the way to Spain, in the United States, right here in Zakati yeah. Park. These were a series of, of not entirely organically related, but nevertheless, simultaneous events that were happening. War against terror for me 
is a recodification of counter-revolutionaries calling themselves war on terror in order to justify themselves. Those who are presumably defending democracy from terrorism, those who want to spread democracy to combat terrorism, are undermining democracy? When you adopt the standpoint of this authentic emancipatory movement, you see the secret complicity of both sides, of Western liberals exactly. and so-called exactly. fundamentalists. Exactly. Exactly. We have to step out exactly. of this exactly. opposition. It's a false opposition they feed on each other. Can we say now that democracy is being undermined daily in the West, in, 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 yeah, the, but, in democracies themselves? Yes, but you know what's crucial here? This non-democratization non of key social economic processes fits perfectly with our false sense of personal freedoms and so on. Well, on that note, <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. All right. I met two of the creators of The Muslims Are Coming, Dean and Negin, and began by asking whether political comedy is more effective than traditional political outreach. You know they are a coming. They're gentle and they're friendly. So open up your arms and give them a hug. We're going on a tour. We're going in Northern Florida next in two weeks. It's called The Muslims Are Coming. It's a one-way trip. <laughs> the goal of the tour is to go out to middle America using comedy, reaching out to people beyond our community. And give America this big Muslim hug. People were just lining up to hug us. Before 9-11, I was doing comedy. I was not talking about anti-Muslim sentiment. I was just talking about American politics. There you go. So things changed around me, and my comedy just shifted to, res to actually embrace what was going on. The fact that a couple of Muslim comedians are on stage even doing comedy is a political act unto itself. Believe me, we're all trying to fight it together. And one thing as about Americans. The, as Americans. Well, I moved to fight Islamophobia as an American. It's not because I'm Muslim. To me, it really offends my notion of what the United States of America is about. When we were looking at stuff like Islamophobia, when we were looking at bigotry, there's nothing political about it. It's wrong, and it's wrong. And that is a matter of social justice, you know what I mean? So, so when people ask me, are you a political comedian, I say, no, I'm actually a social justice comedian. There is no other side of this debate. There was a recent survey came out this summer. Over 60% of Americans have never met a Muslim. So if you've never met us, all you know about us is from the news and from TV, and TV shows like Homeland and movies, you're not gonna like us. That's completely understandable. So the counter narrative is we have to create that. Either human, like adopt a Muslim program, which I'd love to do, like everyone has to have a Muslim friend, or using the mainstream media. We just have less people on our side joining us in this fight against it. That's the problem. Can you separate? Racism in America, Islamophobia in America, from American military intervention in the Muslim world? I think it's so many factors, but I think that the terrorists play a role. They give, for some who don't know anything about us, they allow us, we're allowed to be defined by them. And secondly, those who don't like us, use those examples to define our entire existence. The other thing is, what's really frustrating to me about, um, about the way the Middle East is portrayed is that it's portrayed as one big, brown, violent blob. You know, most Americans are like, Tunisia, no thank you, I'll take my hamburger with ketchup. Seriously? Yeah. So what's so funny about Islamophobia? Uh, Islam is a violent, violent religion. They bring that desert stuff to our world. Real law. Stealth jihad. Islamo Nazism. Say caliphate. Caliphate. Those barbarians. They, kill they want to kill they us. They kill each other. It's very Islamic. They're seeking ways to kill just about everybody. <laughs> right. We went to New York's largest Muslim community in Brooklyn and spoke to Linda Sarsour. What's interesting about Islamophobia? It's not. It's not a right position or a left position. It's unfortunately now being perpetuated by both sides uh, of, the, of the political spectrum. Islamophobia is not just a phenomenon, it's a well-funded industry in this country of millions of dollars and in many cases they're winning. They're trainers of our military, they're trainers of our law enforcement, so they're able to take these ideology into the very institutions that are supposed to be protecting and serving all Americans, including American Muslims and Arab Americans. We also spoke with Mitch Silber, author of the New York Police Department report, Radicalization in the West, The Homegrown Threat, which has been called the blueprint for surveillance. What changed now? Why now there are these young Muslim who carry terrorist acts other than the, the fact that the geopolitical situation in an age of globalization has changed and now the landscape is open? There's an interpretation of Islam, um, a fundamentalist interpretation, 
that has gone, you know, widespread. And also the, on the internet, uh, there's an ability to receive religious guidance from people who don't have the proper authorization. So in a sense, it's been decentralized. And, uh, you know, it really is this cut and paste version of the religion that people who, you know, have little experience are vulnerable to. But when you survey an entire community, yeah. that makes the suspect. Well, you know, I think that's one of the misunderstandings of what happened in New York. Uh, which is what I'm most familiar with. You know, a community of Brooklyn, six thousand, wa Brooklyn was surveyed. Six hundred thousand people can't be surveilled by a group of twenty-four detectives. When I was in my position at the NYPD, we needed to understand how do these people change? Is there a process? Can you detect an individual who's going to turn to violence before they actually are carrying out a plot? From an intelligence perspective, you never want to miss that person. Which means more surveillance. Well, so there's a conflict because ultimately, yes, the most surveillance gives you the most intelligence. No, I don't want to interrupt you. What, what is the conflict then? The conflict is how much intelligence can you collect versus where are the lines with civil liberties? To find out how the war on terror is affecting the Muslim community in the United States, we sat down with Christopher Dickey, the author of Securing the City, Inside America's Best Counterterrorism Force, the NYPD, and Faiza Patil from the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center. There's a growing perception, especially among Muslims, that the war on terror is actually a war against Islam and Muslims. How true is that? How important is that, regardless whether it's true or not? In many parts of the Muslim world, the U.S.'s counterterrorism efforts are perceived as a war on Islam writ large. But when you look at what has happened inside the United States, and particularly with respect to the American Muslim community, you see a dramatic impact. You mean dramatic impact? You mean dramatic negative impact? A dramatically negative impact, because you do have a number of counterterrorism programs that treat American Muslims basically as suspect communities, which really undermines their confidence in themselves as citizens of this country. Which, by definition, undermines American democracy? Oh, yeah, absolutely, it does. I mean, I think Faisal is exactly right. I think that people do feel that they've come under pressure. I think they do feel that the surveillance that's conducted in uh, Muslim communities is onerous. The problem, too, is not only law enforcement. The problem is all these states in the union that see fit to ban Sharia law. Who the hell is talking about Sharia law in any state in the Union? Seriously, this is pure Muslim baiting, a pure generation of hatred against Islam and against Muslims. And I think that that's very dangerous in this country. Of course, what we have now uh, is a situation where you have this being fed by radicals in the Muslim world who want to see a clear-cut confrontation. They want not only the Americans to have to prove uh, what side they're on, the Christians, the Crusaders, as they call them, they want, uh, they want Muslims to have to choose which side they're on. I mean, that's the, that's the game. It's really deplorable and really unfortunate. But really, how much is it Muslim radicals doing that in the, in the Muslim world, and how much is it the constant American military intervention in the Muslim world? If your question is, do Muslims in many parts of the world feel that the United States is at war with them? Oh, hell yeah. Absolutely. I don't think that Al-Qaeda would be conceivable or ISIS would be conceivable without the very strong feeling that and the United States hates Muslims and, and persecutes the, them. And in the age of globalization, in the age of technological revolution, how could you draw the borders anymore between Kabul and Kansas? Well, I don't think you can. Um, and, and that's what's making the administration so nervous, actually. This whole thing started with the premise that freedom at home is tied in to freedom abroad. And hence, they launched the Iraq war and so on and so forth. What did the Iraq war have to do with freedom abroad? Bush, Bush and the neoconservatives, after 9-11, yeah. launched a doctrine in 2002 that says freedom at home yeah, 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 yeah. is related to freedom abroad. No, no. So we I have just, to attack them there so they no, don't attack well, us no, at home. No, 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 we have to That's what they said. No, no, we have to democratize them. No, 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 but nobody no. paid any just, attention. Just, 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 no, 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 just, no, no, Mark. Okay, he's wrong. No, no, just, no, just, finish on his wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> Americans do not want to go out and change the world. They want to keep the world we from changing them. We're talking about American elites. At one point, they were messianic. 
that's and they true. want to change that, the world. It was certainly true that the democratization of Iraq but, but, and yes, the domino effect and the rest the, of the region was the part not, of the But the elites are not detached. Yes, that's right. But the elites are not detached from the people. But, 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 but if you but, just come but, back if to I may, theory, If I may, just, yes, just sure. at this point, what, what is the center, at the center of this thesis is that, no, in fact, political elites are detached from the rest of the people. They're running wars that people are not interested in, point being. The balance sheet 12 years later, 13 years later, is it that freedom abroad and freedom ab at home are compromised or not? Well, I think it has compromised it at home and it hasn't done anything for it abroad. So things are not looking rosier for democracy or for freedom? Well, it's even worse than that because if there is one major terrorist incident in this country, then the kinds of problems we're talking about all the now bets in terms, are off. all bets are off in terms of civil liberties. The grievances of those Muslim communities and the young Muslims who feel that you know their brethren are getting killed on slaughters abroad, that's certainly leading to a certain radicalization. And radical that's radicalization is being defined in a way that it equals terrorism. I actually just push back against this idea that there's some defined process of radicalization. When do we start getting nervous that somebody is actually going to pose a threat to society? Yes. That's the point that you need to define, and that's the point that we haven't defined. What we've said is, we're going to look at all young Muslim men as a potential threat to this society. And when we do that as a society, we risk alienating those people, and we risk alienating those communities. And radicalize them. More concretely, what you risk is that they're going to pull back from cooperating with law enforcement because you need these communities to be helping the police, you need them to be helping the FBI, and they have traditionally done so. When you start targeting religious behavior, you feed into this notion that the United States, and particularly the FBI and the NYPD, are at war with Islam, and that's what we really shouldn't be doing. A lot of it is psychological warfare, mm -hmm. and a lot of that can go wrong, uh, but sometimes it goes right. The model for what is done with all these entrapment cases or supposed entrapment cases in the United States is actually a model that goes back to the old COINTELPRO mm -hmm. operations against domestic American far left wing terrorists in the 1960s and 70s. So is this more of the same now? It, it is, it is, it absolutely is. And you know what the difference is? That now we're talking about 1.3 billion Muslims living in more than 55 countries. To make that your enemy, to make that your test for your machoism, that must backfire sooner or later. I, I am sure that the FBI, the NYPD, any of these organizations would love to show us some vast conspiracy mm -hmm. that's taken but shape here. Seen it. But they haven't seen it. I see mm -hmm. that as a good sign. The overall culture of fear that's, that's been spreading within the country, all of that certainly doesn't bode well for the kind of principles you're trying to defend. You know, I mean, it, it is a pendulum. I mean, normally speaking, the way it has worked has been that in times of crisis, the nations, this nation, sort of cuts back on its civil liberties. Eventually, the pendulum swings back. It is a purely reactive effort to crush this particular group. Everything that's been done over the last 12 years has failed. That the continued military solution to that so, part of the world has failed. So, Marwan, what would you do? Aha. Aha. That's a good question. But thank God I only ask the questions. I don't have to ask <laughs> When we return, we travel to England and France to see how they are doing in the war on terror and what the war on terror is doing to them. They can maintain these structures of undemocratic or illiberal power in place. It's easy to be liberal when the going is good. When the going is tough, that's when your liberality is tested. I was a young man, I was looking to get out and sort of see the world. I was stopped from travelling and I was held for nine hours. I spent two years under house arrest and six months of that I was held in a high security prison. The judge, after two years he'd finally seen the evidence, he completely exonerated me. For 13 years, the rights are only rights for certain people. We met Thierry Boulivant in London, his home city where he says he was wrongfully arrested and then detained without evidence or due process. But maybe that's just the price some people have had to pay for Britain's part in the war on terror, swapping liberality for security. 
the concept of a covenant on security in Britain was never actually written down. And the idea was that Britain would be liberal um, and continue its liberality towards groups who have radical aims, as long as those radical aims were not directed at the United Kingdom. Now Tony Blair has been warned. Pull your troops out of Afghanistan. Pull your troops out of Iraq. And if you do not pull your troops out, you will get bloodshed on the streets of London. What the 7-7 bombings did was to create an undeniable fact that we had a homegrown terrorist problem. If it becomes clear that there are powers which the police and intelligence agencies need immediately to combat terrorism, it is plainly sensible to reserve the right to return to Parliament with an accelerated timetable. Control orders were one new power, restricting the movement and freedom of terrorist suspects, all of whom at first were non-UK citizens. By the end of control order regime six years later, all were British citizens, all Muslim. Knee-jerk reactions where you criminalize and stigmatize entire communities don't provide us more security, they make us uh, less safe. Through all the counter-terrorist legislation that, in the way it's framed and the way it's implemented, you know, um, creates this kind of siege mentality amongst young Muslims. This is James Wright Foley, an American citizen. The man in the mask spoke with a clear British accent. You have been at the forefront of the aggression towards the Islamic State. You have plotted against us and gone far out of your way to find reasons to interfere in our affairs. The ambition to create an extremist caliphate in the heart of Iraq and Syria is a threat to our own security here in the UK. No name, no face, just a voice. Enough to confirm that Britain had been too soft, too liberal for its own good. We are stopping suspects from traveling by seizing passports. We're barring foreign nationals from re-entering the UK. We're depriving people of citizenship. Young British people have been going abroad to fight in other theaters of war since Bosnia, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, East Africa, and other places. But that's not a reason for changing any of the basic principles on which our government functions or our law functions. ISIL is recruiting new fighters from all over the world. 500 have gone there from my country, Britain. Britain is said to have a real jihadi problem. And the root cause, according to British Prime Minister, is one of values. Under the doctrine of state multiculturalism, we've encouraged different cultures to live separate lives. We've even tolerated these segregated communities behaving in ways that run completely counter to our values. Muslims are being told again and again that we need to embrace British values. At the same time, our government is, is pursuing policies that are complete, in complete contradiction to British values. It's easy to be liberal when the going is good. When the going is tough, that's when your liberality is tested. When it's not easy to be liberal, that's when you find out how liberal you really are. We're in London to find out what effect 13 years of the war on terror has had on liberality on both sides of the Atlantic. What does it mean to the West? for them to continuously be intervening militarily through undemocratic means in a different region. How does that reflect back on the West? See, I think it's counterproductive, because if, if you are bringing democracy on the back of a tank, it's counterproductive. Do you sense that the West is slowly but surely becoming authoritarian on this level, on the level of decision-making on foreign policy? Yeah, but I think we, we can already see that, you know, because when you create this whole thing like, you know, terror, war on terror, you can see the human rights and civil rights in the USA are being curtailed. I mean, the example of National Security Agency is blatant. I mean, what is going on? And the, and the, and the main focus of these surveillance campaigns for the time being are Muslims. No, of course, you see, Muslims, it's a long story. Muslims are the other. You agree that such persistent and continuous intervention in other people's affairs militarily is reflecting bad on Western democracy? No, I don't think so at all. Firstly, it isn't consistent and, you know, kind of uh, going on. And it certainly isn't... How about a year? How about every, a war every year? It's not, it's not undemocratic. Well, it's not a war every year. For the last, two, we for the last 12 years, we can count 12 wars. No. What, what are the 12 wars? You want what me to count yeah, them for you? By the way, I asked the questions, but I will welcome a couple from you. 
Afghanistan, no, no, no. Iraq, Yemen, conflicts. Somalia, on. Mali. Shall I go on? Well, no, hang on, hang on. Well, you won't get to 12, firstly. But uh, secondly, these aren't wars in the conventional sense. If you're calling drone attacks wars, pff, I mean, you can do so if you want to, but it's a very different setup. What is it? What is it when you attack uh, various places whenever you want in places like Somalia? What do you call well, that? Then? Hang on, if hang it's on. It's not a war. What do you who call it? Who are people attacking here? Wait a second. Who are people attacking here? They're not going to war with the country. They are doing precision target attacks on terrorists. What does it mean for American presidents to start giving assassination orders of people, including Americans, overseas? It what does it mean to democracy? It means protecting that democracy in this context. It means people who wish to do you harm, wish to do your citizens harm, and, and you have an opportunity to end that harm, you take it. That's so, what it means. There's nothing undemocratic about that. Originally, the idea was based on the... But the first care of every democratic leader is the security of their people. That's the first There's care. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Surely today there are more threats coming from the Great Middle East than before 9-11. Uh, well, they're probably the same level of threats, just in a different configuration. Same level of threats. Well, look at look at look, look at Iraq, look at on. Syria, look at look Somalia, at look at Yemen, look at Mali, well, look at Al North Africa. Al wasn't picked up in 2001. This is a whole issue. We didn't take it seriously. We allowed a threat to escalate to a certain point, then it showed itself properly, and then there was action to roll it back. There's a there's a date I think that we need to look at, which is the end of the Bush presidency. Is the world today? a safer or less safer place than in 2008 and 9. And I would contend, actually, in 2008 and 9, the world was safer than in 2001, and we're now in a more dangerous place. And that reflects what's happened since that time, when we've disengaged, when the West is disengaged from the Middle East. It turns out that disengagement is as dangerous a problem as engagement. But you see, again, if Western powers, America, are doing something, quite honestly, don't, they don't know if we do this, if we remove this dictatorship, what will come next? They have, because it's uncharted territory. So the Nobody genie knows. is out of the box. Nobody I knows. I think, you see, ultimately comes down to democracy, one person, one vote, okay? And those people who have never been given a chance to exercise one person, one vote, and they are used to shutting up their mouths, etc. once you open that up, then the first thing they fall on is identity politics. I am a Kurd, I am a Sunni, I am a Shiite, you know. In a way, that's the starting point for democracy, but it takes time. I think each country has its own uh, culture and background. It has to grow out of that, you know, and it takes time. How do you see this moving forward? Do you see that we're going to have more of the same and, and intentions are going to continue to exasperate with the recent intervention in Iraq? Or do you think this is going to be wrapped up? No, I think everyone has stated we are now in a long battle with radical Islam. It's the long war. And radical Islam, not Islam, radical Islam. And the Islamic world is at a battle with radical Islam as well, as we've seen from what's been going on on the ground. Until that battle has been won, these interventions are going to continue. And you think, you, you think long wars like that, how do, they, how do they reflect on their own original societies, the democratic Western societies? I think as long as they're handled with democratic norms in place, they don't affect them at all. On the contrary, they can actually enhance solidarity in democratic societies, reminding us what the values are, the ideals are, that are under threat from those ideological fascists, essentially, who wish to impose a different system. In two words, you think the continuous war, the long war, as it's called here, do you think this long war will have good or bad repercussions on Western democracies? Yeah, I think if they go for violence, there'll be negative, there'll be negative uh, uh, consequences. So military interventions will happen. Each of the democracies responds to warring on terror in its own particular way. In the United States, the primary concern is security. The British need to believe they're doing the proper thing. And the fault lies with less well-brought-up societies. For the French, it's about culture, even one might say about fashion. In 2004, France passed a law banning the display of ostentatious religious symbols in public places, such as government offices, hospitals, and most emphatically, schools. Quel que soit le nom qu'on lui donne, la kippa ou une croix de manifestement de dimension excessive n'ont pas leur place dans les enceintes des écoles publiques. L'école publique restera laïque. Cette loi veut réaffirmer le principe de laïcité et puisqu'il y a une émotion particulière... Et c'est le miracle de la laïcité. 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 Laïc
Laïcité est une particularly French commitment to secularism. The separation of religion from the political sphere and vice versa. Just like America's war on terror, France's secular war on religious apparel has gone to great lengths to reassure the people it most affects that they're not being singled out. Ce n'est pas une loi qui vise à interdire le voile islamique. There is no stigmatization of the Muslim community. To see if French Muslims have been stigmatized or secularized, we met up with Anne-Marie Laglenec, a specialist in democracy studies, and one of France's leading intellectuals, Edoui Plenel, author of the timely new book, Pour les Musulmans, for the Muslims. Whenever I hear the word laicity and secularism, it all boils down to one word, Muslims. Because yes. apparently this is the obsession. They, they our politician, they don't accept our country, our people, like it is. There is also a very big mistake about laicity. Laicity, in our story, it was not the persecution of religion. It was a mean to recognize minority religion. One century after 1905, one century later, we're back to the same question of discriminating against religious minorities under the rubric of secularism. Mm. That's what we're doing in, in France and in Europe? Yes, there is a, a new word in our public debate. That is a colonial word, assimilation. They say we got a French national identity. You must be assimilate. You must be like me. You must disappear in the public space. No head, no head scarf. scarf. No head scarf. You don't exist. You don't, want, a you don't, want, you don't exist as don't, a Muslim. You don't want diversity. You don't want plurality. Uh, exactly. And Muslims and, are the target. Yes, and that's the reason. That's the reason for me. That's the Muslim question. It's not for the Muslim. It's for all of us. It's the French question. Let me um, raise a point here. I mean, the, the headscarf uh, shouldn't be a problem. There is one problem, however, to my, in my eyes, which is the, the, the niqab or the, 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 the full, the veiled face. In 2013, the French passed another clothing restriction. Now a concern for security was cited. The niqab can no longer be worn in public. In France, in the public space, you have to make your face visible. It's a way to respect each other, and it's also a way to preserve security, 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 security. Oh, mes frères, uh, mes frères de France, mes frères Allah de France, d'Europe, du monde entier, inshallah. Le djihad en Syrie il est obligatoire. The ban on headscarves and veils has been to no avail. Je suis français, de, de père français et de mère française. Et euh, mes parents, ils sont, ils sont athées. Alhamdulillah, Allah, il m'a guidé. Je me suis converti à l'islam il y a bientôt trois ans. Secular France, like liberal Britain, is said to have a jihadi problem. A real threat at home, as well as abroad. Oui, il y a un risque. Et ce risque, il nous faut y faire face. Au Conseil de défense, de renforcer la présence des forces de l'ordre dans les moyens de transport et notamment les moyens de transport souterrains. It's all about security. At least this is the justification for seeing the Muslims as the other, that they are a threat, an enemy from within Europe, from within the West. The problem is that so many things have been conflated together. I mean, look at the word immigration used in EU official documents, in politician, uh, uh, re political rhetoric uh, in, in, in various states, immigration and terrorism. This goes together. So, I mean... And uh, hello, uh, Islam uh, and terrorism. And, and incapacity to distinguish clearly about problems. But I wouldn't say there is not a security problem. There is a terrorist problem, which is very real and which has to be dealt with because democracies have a right to defend themselves. But it's associated with Islam. Yes, That's the problem. The, the, what is the, the point? This problem is not a problem of security. It's a political problem. <laughs> Do we act like the 30 last years? 
with the expedition, intervention, with no political solution. So you think the security issue is a blowback from yes. military interventions? Yes, because they react really in a short term. They create their monsters. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They go away with big intervention, big lies, no control of the people, no democratic debate. And in fact, we got the Islamic State. And in fact, we are our the people in a trap, jihad or crusade. My reply is no jihad, no crusade, democracy, democracy. The war on terror and the way it was practiced, the way Edwy yeah. just explained it, did it or did not bring a blowback? I don't know if this is absolutely linked with the growth of uh, more breeding terrorists uh, in Europe. I mean, uh, a number of um, young people have not been integrated in our society. And this is something which was spelled out in 2004, for instance, in the so-called European security strategy, alienated young men which who foster terrorism but that we have bred in our societies. Have we done anything for that? I mean, there are just... After speaking with Anne-Marie and Edoui, we were joined by international politics professor Philippe Gouloub and Alain Grech, of Le Monde Diplomatique. These, these interventions are now having domestic implications. And we see rising racism, we see anti-Islamism. What do you do with that? When there is an employment, there is a tendency to say the foreigners are responsible. And here you have created something which didn't exist in the 60s. In the 60s, nobody was speaking about Islam. So, but, but it is suicidal to make an enemy out of 1.5 billion people. Yes. But I'm not sure that our politicians are thinking so big. Our politicians in France are thinking about France, French policy. In France, in France, Muslims are 5 to 10 percent. But there is one important point on this question of Islamophobia in uh, France. In the 30s, when you have anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism was the, a right-wing position. Islamophobia is a position you find in all the political parties, including, uh, including the left, including the left of the left. People saying it's a danger against uh, laicity, it's a danger against our uh, principle, it's against our culture, etc. You worked a lot on the Cold War. Is that a difference? Because there were always local enemies, radical civil rights uh, activists, uh, Romas, Jews, whatever. But now, does, does a new Muslim encompass all of them together? Yes, what's different? What's the same is, is that the, exter the external enemy structures, uh, uh, structures and organizes the national security state. When the state makes a claim that that is an existential danger, this gives the state the means to affirm its autonomy vis-a-vis -vis of its own population, to institute systems of, of government that bypass the normal constitutional process. That doesn't sound democratic. It's me. not democratic. And that's what we have And we're seen. seeing that in the UK, we're seeing it everywhere. in France. We're, we're seeing, seeing it everywhere. We're seeing it everywhere. Yes, and you see a strengthening of this. After 9-11, what happened? You already had the structure. The Cold War structure was never dissolved. The security structures, after 9-11, these structures became much larger, much more autonomous in the United States, but also in France. So even if the war ends in Iraq, presumably, or in Afghanistan, those structures don't go anywhere. They, those structures remain. And so long as the governments can make the claim that there's this existential danger out there that also is a domestic threat, then they can maintain these structures of undemocratic or illiberal power in place. There are terrorist cells, there are operational terrorist cells, or, or, or cells that are in, ready to engage in, in direct action, direct militarized action. But it, none of these actually present existential threats to the Western core states, or to China, for instance, or to, or to Russia. The problem for democracy here is, how do you make sure that in the process of actually dealing with the real threats rather than the exaggerated threats, you don't completely hollow out hollow out the democratic norms that have founded the compact in our societies up till now. And for the moment, the democratic side of that battle, battle is being lost. But you know what they say, you're going to have to limit certain democratic rights because that's the way you protect the democracy. No, I don't think so. But if you want to be efficient again, we must have stabilization in the Middle East and we must have the Muslim population also against this attack. I think most of them are against this attack. But if you antagonize them every time, they will stay on the line and 
But what they're saying today is that there are huge Muslim communities in Europe and the United States. You're going to have to create surveillance and guess an entire population because they're all Muslims. It might, it might be better to actually begin trying to seriously integrate them into the social and political structures of the countries that they are living in, give them not only equal opportunities, but actually the conditions, the affirmative action. But that's a long-term solution, they argue. They but you say, have to start that, but you have to start that long-term solution yeah, but you, but, what you, but what do you do to Kirtle today? You do the and attack that could happen. You do no, both look, you do, you do both. You have to actually, it's, it's exactly right. You have to do two things at the same time. You have to build the socioeconomic opportunity structures and at the same time do the necessary elementary police work to avoid the most extremist, damaging types of action that could occur. Doing both at the same time will create inclusion. You, have to, you need an inclusive strategy, not merely one which excludes and which, and which stigmatizes. They're, they're the new other. The Soviet Union was the other. Communism was the other during what we call the Cold War. Uh, today, Muslims as a category have been constructed. It's a bit of a caricature that Huntington helped to, you know, Samuel Huntington helped to, helped to produce with his clash of civilization. But that was intellectually discredited, and now it's back in, in, in action. Now we are, now French it's, minister it's would so say... Much easier. It's so much easier. It's for people who are intellectually and morally lazy. It's so much easier to frame the world in terms of essential categories, them and us. Muslims are not like us, or, or third world peoples are not like us. But, but, but this is becoming more and we more dangerous. Civil. It's extraordinarily dangerous because you're essentializing the other. Essentially and it's extraordinarily undemocratic. Undemocratic. You're saying the other is not fully human. We are rational. We are at the top of civilization. The others are at a lesser stage of civilization. They're from a previous stage of history. Is Islam and Muslims becoming the new test of Western and European democracy? Yes, I think so, really. And, and it's a, I think it's a problem for the next 20 or 30 years, which is the main problem of the European society. Can you imagine Judaism being compared to a mafia in the Western media because of decades of Israeli occupation? Or for that matter, Christianity depicted as inherently violent because of centuries of Western colonialism? Most certainly not. So why is Islam being depicted by so many as a source of evil and extremism? I'll tell you why. It's because it is a cheap and easy way to avoid serious conversation about geopolitics, marginalization, and economic and social failures. Those who refuse to accept responsibility for the utter failure of the costly war on terror over the past dozen years are scapegoating Islam and Muslims as the source of much of the violence and extremism. Instead of re-examining their policies, they focus on religion as if Islam was born on September 11. This is as cynical as it is dangerous. And the reason why I think it's important during these critical times is not merely to defend Islam and Muslims against such contempt, but to expose the hypocrites behind it.